So again, hello and welcome to SFU and the Faculty of Environment. I do see some familiar names in the group, which is great. Welcome back. And to those that are here for the first time, thanks for joining us. We have a new slate of speakers this week, so fresh content, even if you have joined us before. And I think that you're really going to enjoy this evening. So just to introduce myself, I'm Donna Dove, and I work in the Dean's Office for the Faculty of Environment. My co-host today is Marina Miller. Marina, if you can give a little wave. Marina is a student from our Global Environmental Systems Program, and we're both really excited to have you here this evening and have an opportunity to share a bit about who we are as a faculty and hopefully make you feel welcomed and part of our community. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Kwekwitlam, Kikite, Kwantlen, Semiamo, and Tawasan peoples on whose traditional territories our three campuses reside. We're privileged to live, learn, and gather on this land. If you have any questions over the course of the session, please feel free to use the raise the hand feature um, if you'd like to verbally ask your question, and that button is down in the reactions section in the lower toolbar, or simply type your question into the chat if you prefer. Please don't be shy, this session is for you, and likely if you have a question, there are three other people who have the exact same question. So here is a quick run through of our agenda. We have lots to share this evening. Uh, for those of you that are returning, the first few slides you've seen before, and I apologize for that, but they're really important to cover for those that are joining for the first time. So we'll go through some brief highlights of SFU, so you get to know your larger SFU community. One of our first year professors, Dennis Sangate. Dennis, you can give a little wave there, from our archaeology department. Uh, Everybody. Is going to share a bit. And if you're not an ARC major, that's okay. He may just pique your curiosity into doing a minor or a circ in certificate in archeology span or just taking some electives there. Then we're gonna uh, introduce you to three of our current students who act as mentors for new students. And we want you to meet them, hear why they took on this role, some of the fun things they did as a group during our, our, this past fall when new students all joined us remotely and you'll get to ask all of your questions. And just to note that we have officially designated tonight as dumb question night. So we wanna hear all those questions that you think might be dumb questions. So first off, we want to say congratulations to all of you for being admitted to SFU. We know that the pandemic has not made it easy for you completing your high school. You've persevered through many challenges and, and we hope that you're really proud of your accomplishment. SFU was named number one comprehensive university this year. And in fact, we've held that honor for 12 out of the past 13 years. And if you're not sure what comprehensive university means, that wouldn't be a dumb question because most people don't know. But I'll tell you, it includes all Canadian universities that have a significant amount of research activity on their campuses and a wide range of programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, including professional programs. But we're classified different from those universities that have medical schools because we don't. And there are also a group of universities that are classified as just teaching universities and they don't have research happening on their campus. And that research component is really important to us at SFU and should be to you too, because it means you're being taught by those researchers who are leaders in their fields and you get access uh, to them and to getting involved in that research as well. SFU is ranked one of the top 35 universities in the world for innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. And did you know there are approximately 25,000 universities in the world? So again, be proud of your accomplishment. You've been admitted to SFU and this is now your university. I'm gonna turn it over to Marina, my co-host. Thanks, Donna. So hi again, I'm Marina. 
I'm about to complete a Bachelor of Environment in Global Environmental Systems, and it's been a great five years at SFU. I've done various volunteering and co-op jobs throughout my degree, and right now I'm doing one more from Faculty of Environment, and I get to talk to awesome students like you. So next, I'm going to go over a few features of student life and what you could expect on campus. So while students have been home during the pandemic, SFU Burnaby has gone under a lot of renovation. The new student union building is something I've gotten to see get built from the ground up, and I'm so glad that future students like you will get to enjoy it. It's going to include lounges, study areas, meeting rooms, a rec facility, even things like a napping room, a gaming lounge, space for clubs, a stage, music rooms, community kitchen, and I could go on and on. It's a beautiful building and I'm excited for you to go. There's also two brand new residence buildings to accommodate our growing community. There are single occupancy rooms for residents, which is nice for privacy, but there's still a lot of social space like study rooms and wellness spaces. So I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Marina. So next on our agenda, I'd like to introduce you to one of our first year professors, Dennis Sangeth. And Dennis is from our archaeology department and will be teaching ARC 131 this fall. Uh, that's human origins. And even again, if you're not an archaeology major, you may be interested in it as one of your electives or as part of a minor or certificate. Dennis has been involved in some super interesting research um, in excavating cave sites around the world and all sorts of things. So Dennis, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I will stop my screen share. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, let me first see about sharing my screen, see if I can figure out how to do this. Can you guys see that? We can, yes. Okay, let me uh, start this. Okay, that looks like it's working. Perfect. Good, yes, um, thanks Donna. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Archaeology and, and I, I, I mainly, um, uh, you know, um, my main job is to teach courses, but I also do research. And I'll just give you a little bit of background on me so you kind of know what sort of courses I teach. Um, there's lots of different types of archaeologists, depending on, uh, you know, they differ in the time periods they, that they study or the regions of the world they study or the types of things that they analyze. But I study um, Paleolithic archaeology, and that's the study of, you know, really early human behavior, um, sites and artifacts that date from, you know, before 10,000 years ago, and maybe as old as three and a half million years. And I also study paleoanthropology, and that's the study of human evolution. Um, and I... Donna said, I, I excavate cave sites where, uh, you know, caves that were inhabited um, by early human ancestors and some of uh, us early humans, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, or even hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I work mainly in, in Southwest France, where there are lots of caves like this, this very famous region for, for caves full of archeology. span And these are caves that are occupied by our cousins, the Neanderthals, probably a lot of you have heard of Neanderthals before. And also by some of our ancestors, early modern humans who migrated into Europe 40,000 years ago. And so at sites like this, we find things like the remains of Neanderthals. This is the these are the remains of a Neanderthal child. And uh, we find modern human remains. We find thousands and thousands and thousands of stone tools. And we find the animal bones from people butchering and eating animals. And so the sorts of things that I'm, I, I study and things that come up in my courses are or thing, you know, I, I'd like, I'm trying to answer questions like, you know, did Neanderthals, for example, did they bury their dead like a lot of modern human cultures do? Did um, Neanderthals know how to make fire? And uh, a really big question, why did Neanderthals disappear when we modern humans arrived in Europe um, 40,000 years ago? But I've also um, excavated cave sites in Morocco as well, in North Africa. Um, and at this particular cave here, uh, it's called Smuggler's Cave, sounds pretty exciting. It's on the Atlantic coast of, of Morocco. And um, some years ago when we were excavating here, my colleagues and I, we, we found the remains of, a, of an eight-year-old girl who lived in the cave and died in the cave about 100,000 years ago. This is what her skull looked like um, when we found it when we excavated it. It's you know, all in tiny fragments. And this is a virtual reconstruction um, put together by an artist. And this is a, an actual reconstruction of what she looked like when she was alive. 
Um, she, in fact, is so far, she's the oldest modern human child that anybody's found anywhere. So those are the sorts of things I do. Um, and I, I, I teach a number of courses. I, I teach a, you know, a, 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 a course on the prehistory of the old world, archaeology 272. And I teach an upper level course on um, stone tool technology. And in fact, in this course, um, we even, the students even get to learn how to, how to flint nap. We've got a, the, uh, the Department of Archaeology is a, has a flint napping pit out behind the building. But um, the course I've been teaching the longest, uh, the course I teach the most often, and, and, and my favorite course to teach is Human Origins, this first year course. It's, um, I really like this course because it's uh, a big picture course. <clears throat> it's um, the story of human evolution for the most part, and it's the, the sciences of paleoanthropology and biological anthropology and archaeology all rolled into one. It's this big picture look at, at the human condition, why we look the way we do and why we do the things we do. And if there's one thing that unites all the people, um, all the people of the world, regardless of you know, where you're from, what language you speak, or your skin color, it's this story of, of human origins. And I'll give you just a quick background of, of what the course involves, <clears throat> just covering the highlights. We spent a bit of time learning about how evolution works and about Charles Darwin and the, and the theory of natural selection. We spend more time learning about primates because we humans are primates like monkeys and apes. We share a, a common evolutionary history with monkeys and apes, um, going all the way back to the extinction of the dinosaurs. And so we share a lot of aspect, aspects of um, anatomy and physiology and behavior. And this is in fact one of the more popular parts of the course because everybody, including myself, really likes looking at cute monkeys and apes. And a significant part of the course um, involves learning about our fossil ancestors, you know, kind of the ancient pre-human ancestors of ours that evolved first in Africa from uh, ape-like ancestors starting millions of years ago. So in the course, we travel through, uh, you probably can't see my cursor. We travel through the, you know, our evolutionary tree starting at the very bottom and these, these very early times and move up through the tree to the, to the tips of the branches that represent, you know, modern time periods and, and, and recent ancestors of ours. And we look at where the fossils are found, um, how and why our ancestral species change through time, how they're related to each other and where they fit with each other in the family tree, the sorts of artifacts we find um, with them. And we try and answer some of the really big questions about what it means to be human. So for example, why did we evolve such big brains? Why did we walk around on two feet? Why did we lose so much of the body hair coverage that's common among most mammals? And things like why, what's made us so successful as a species, so su successful that we've really come to dominate the planet so dramatically. Oh. And um, what technologies did we invent along the way? And when did these appear? Things like stone tools or hunting weapons or fire or clothing. And eventually you get to the, the emergence of our own lineage, the modern humans. And we'll follow this story from where we first appeared in Africa about 350,000 years ago, and then eventually started leaving Africa not that long ago, 80,000 years ago is not that long ago in, in, in evolutionary terms, and we spread out into the rest of the world quite quickly. And so we'll, answer, we'll, we'll, we'll try and answer some of the big questions that, that, that deal specifically with us. You know, how are we different from our, our evolutionary ancestors? Um, did we interbreed with some of these different human species? When did we start wearing jewelry and creating art and why did we start doing that? And how did we come to be the only species left on the planet? And at the very end of the course, we'll, we'll take a look at, at the reason for the variability that we, we see among us modern humans. Um, why do people from different regions look different in some ways? And we'll talk a little bit about the history of, of the, the concept of race. And just a, a spoiler alert, you know, we can learn, we'll learn in this course that genetically, there's no such thing as different races. In fact, as a species, we have less genetic vari variability than almost all the other animals. And, and that's where the course ends. So we really get to cover some of the really big things about, about, you know, why we humans are the way we are, why we behave the way we do, and how we came to be this way. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that um, that anybody has about the course or about archaeology or? That 
was fascinating, Dennis. Thanks, Donna. Really I, interesting. I, I want to take your course now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir, you're very welcome to any time. Yeah, it's, 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 it really is my favorite course to teach because um, obviously the, the course goes into some detail, but we get to really touch on a lot of the really big things about, about what it means to be a human without going into too, too much detail. Absolutely. Okay, students, this is your chance to ask Dennis a question. And like Donna said, there's no such thing as dumb questions. We'll give you guys a little minute to think about your question and type it in there. Um, and Dennis, just as, as they're starting to think about their question, um, I'll, I'll mention this. One of the reasons that we bring first year professors to our Zoom sessions is that students are often really nervous and intimidated by professors. And so we really want them to meet kind of the person behind the professor. And as I hope you can all see, Dennis isn't so scary. So that's, that's great. Um, but Dennis, can you think of one piece of advice that you might give to new students coming in the fall? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's been a long time since I was in your guys' place, but uh, I, you know, I still remember you know, my first year, my first semester when I started university. I went to the University of Calgary you know, quite, a, quite a while ago. And I was, I was really nervous as well. And, uh, and you feel like, um, you always feel like everybody else has kind of got things figured out and you're the, you're the only one who doesn't. And that's just, that's just clearly not true. Um, everybody in, especially everybody in the first year, like you guys is in the same boat. And um, the one, the one biggest piece of advice I would have is, is to try and get over your, your shyness and ask questions uh, of each other. Um, but also when you're in class, ask questions I, I, I can't stress this enough that professors really like when students ask questions. Uh, it, you know, and, and I really encourage my students in my classes. My classes are usually quite large classes. And, and so it's, you know, it's, we, you can't have discussions very often. They're very often they're 200, sometimes 300 students. So it's, it's difficult to have discussions, but um, I really like when students ask questions because it gives me an idea of where you guys are at you know, in the topic, you know, how, how I'm getting things across to you. And um, it also gives me an idea of what things students are interested in. So very often we, we can actually kind of head off, head off in, in directions that I hadn't planned on and talk about things that I hadn't intended to include. And I really enjoy that, that's a lot of fun. So I really, uh, and I'm always impressed when students do ask questions, especially when it's clear that you're nervous, I really, um, you know, admire students who overcome that nervousness and ask questions anyway. And like Donna said, if you've got a question, odds are that um, there's lots of other students in the class who have the same question and they will also uh, uh, thank you for, for being the brave person to, to speak up. And the, 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 the more you, so, so I just want to ask thing, the more you ask questions, the braver you'll become. The, the more you push yourself and, and, and overcome your initial shyness, the more you start to realize it's just, there's no reason for it. And it will very, very rapidly disappear. Great advice and so very true. And look at, uh, we got some brave souls here. Um, so one question, which campus do you teach at? Uh, I, well, I teach at um, both Burnaby and at Surrey and occasionally down at uh, downtown Harbor Center. Um, Archaeology 131 Human Origins course, it's offered uh, with multiple sections. We have multiple sections on Burnaby campus each semester. Um, there's, a, there's always a section in Surrey. There's sometimes a section downtown and we also have an online section. So okay. it's a, it, this is a course that's easy to take. Nice. And Fernando has a great question. You said that there isn't such things uh, such thing as race in humans. What do you mean by that? So we are so, we are so, used to thinking about races we are we have been kind of trained and this isn't a new thing um and, and and in fact things are better now than they've ever been in the history of the world but um but uh we've been kind of trained to, to see differences and that's just normal and that's not something that i expect will ever disappear but we're really really um in attuned to differences between different people and it's probably it was probably a very useful thing for us to have in our evolutionary past 
But when you look at the genetics of us modern humans, we are so closely related to each other. Take two people who you who look really, really different to you, who have very different skin color, you know, and, and different you know hair color and different hair type and you know different eye color, different stature, all those things, all those things that we kind of think of as different. Take two people that really look different, and if you look at their their genetics, their genes, they will be almost identical. Um, more identical than say two, I don't know, two grizzly bears that to you look absolutely identical. Those two grizzly bears will have way more genetic differences between them, um, even if they're related to each other, than two humans from two, two different parts of the of the world. We're just we're just incredibly the, in spite of the variability that we pick up on, we are really, really closely related. So, um, the, so there's just no, so the differences that we imagine between two people that look very different, they're not reflected in our genetics. They're really superficial. Fascinating. Interesting. Gabriella has a question. Is there any hands-on field research in the first year course? Uh, not in any first year courses, no. Um, the only, yeah, we don't really have any hands-on research until you get into the upper level courses. The only really real hands-on things in the uh, lower level courses, um, you know, except during COVID conditions is when we bring in, you know, teaching, um, uh, you know, artifacts and, and fossils to, to classes. Um, but when you get into the upper level courses, there's there's a lot of hands-on. Archaeology is a very hands-on thing. So when you get into upper level courses, uh, especially lab-based courses in archaeology, there's, it's it's almost all hands-on. Learning how to how to identify and analyze, you know, different types of artifacts and human remains and animal remains, that sort of thing. Excellent. And Cole has asked, would you recommend majoring in archaeology or anthropology? I know it's mainly based on personal interest, but I can't decide. Good question. Uh, this is completely unbiased archaeology, hands down. <laughs> I should say, you know, Donna was talking about how um, SFU is one of the top universities in the world. Uh, our department, the archaeology department, is is one of the top uh, archaeology uh, departments in the world. We were number one out of uh, in I can't remember, I can't remember what this means in QI listings uh, uh, around the world this past year. Yes, and and I think you guys have held that for a couple years or been. Really yeah, we've been close. we've been very high for for years, but this is the first year we've been number one. Uh, not that's not in Canada. That's globally. It's yeah, that's a huge, huge honor for sure. Yeah. Um, and what career options would a bachelor's degree in archaeology offer? Yeah, it's it's most of our graduates these days um, go uh, go and get a job doing consulting archaeology, working for consulting companies. This is a growing um, industry, uh, especially in British Columbia. So any every time. Um, developers want to, you know, put a shovel on the ground. So if they're building a new highway or putting in a pipeline or, or doing any serious forestry or mining, before they disturb any, any of the ground, they have to bring in archaeologists who will see what's there, see if there are any important archaeological sites. And if there are, they, they try and, you know, do some excavation to find out what's there before, before it gets destroyed. And, and so archaeology, uh, so, um, uh, British Columbia, this is pretty common around the world, but in Canada and especially British Columbia, there are, are quite a few consulting companies and it's where most of our graduates go and get jobs. It's a, it's a, it's a really, you know, viable and exciting career option. Uh, um, people start out doing kind of, you know, field, field work for companies like this and eventually move up into companies and, and direct the field work. Uh, it's a, um, uh, where you get to use all of the skills you learn in university, not just in archaeology, but in university in general. And Dennis, um, I know there's a whole kind of um, pathway, for lack of a better word, within our archaeology department that focuses on forensics. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about that as well? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, most I think most people are familiar nowadays with forensic anthropology, uh, which is more related to archaeology and what we call biological anthropology than it is to to cultural anthropology that you that you um, learn about in in an anthropology department. So there's like all sorts of TV shows that we're all familiar with, uh, CSI New York and CSI Las Vegas and Bones and Cold Case, uh, and these all have this this you know this big forensic anthropology component where where researchers their their job is to to uh, um, you know identify the remains of, of of you know victims murder victims or accident victims um, when re those remains are found um, by the police for example. And you know, identify who the person is, where they're from, how they died, that sort of thing. And that's a that's a big part of our department. Uh, you know, um, Hugo Cardoso, uh, one of our faculty members, he teaches. Uh, um, he's a he's a, a very very well respected uh, forensic anthropologist globally, and he teaches these courses. Uh, he and his students teach courses on forensic anthropology, and uh, graduates of that. Probably not with just a, a BA, but you know, with a with a master's, or if you carry on to a PhD, um, uh, graduates of that program go on, and you know, they'll work for uh, corner offices offices around the world, or or very often they'll a lot of them will do research, but some will go and do things like spend some time working for the United Nations, investigating, um, you know. Uh, Genocide, uh, you know, it's horrible uh, incidents of genocide that have occurred in a few places around the world, uh, where there are a lot of, um, unfortunately, a lot of murder victims whose remains are need to be dealt with. Yeah, we did a feature on uh, one of our current students, uh, Chantel, and she right. had done a co-op position with local RCMP in um, their forensic investigative side of things so she right. she really enjoyed that um, yeah one of our sorry one of our um uh phd graduates uh she graduated some years ago she directed uh, much of the work at the at the twin towers in new york after 9-11 wow so sarah asks i'm really interested in the travel aspect of archaeology was it easy for you to travel to all those places around the world and is it the same today uh, well, not under COVID, no. Uh, archaeology has been put on a archaeological archaeological fieldwork has been put on hold, you know, for a couple of years now. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that's really attractive about archaeology is that um, you know that it typically involves travel, and um, and so yeah, so I've been I've been traveling to to France and Morocco for twenty almost twenty five years now, up, up until last year I, w I went every year, uh, and it's a big part of it and. Um, not everybody. So there's some 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 archaeologists who do uh, who don't do field work, but the majority of archaeologists do do field work. And so in our department, we've got people who work in 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 different parts of Africa and in Asia and in Europe and in lots of different places in North America, the American Southwest. We've got several faculty, not surprisingly, who work here in British Columbia, um, do archaeology here and work with First Nations here. Um, yeah. So we travel have, is a big part of it. Um, we, your department has um, a field school in Portugal, is that correct? Yeah, currently Hugo Cardoso, the, our forensic anthropologist, he has a, a field school in, in Portugal where they're, where they're excavating um, medieval, a medieval cemetery. Uh, we have another um, faculty member, uh, Cristina Jovas, and she does work in the Caribbean. Um, We've had in the past fields, uh, quite a few local field schools, uh, and um, and that's something that will probably continue for the foreseeable future. Excellent. And another question: How difficult would it be to start an archaeology career in a European country post graduation? Oh, I. I guess it depends on what. What's the, Type of career you have in mind. So if you're if you're talking about a kind of an academic career, so you want to go and teach at a university in, in Europe, then um, um, it can be quite competitive. But uh, and that would involve going all the way through and getting a PhD. Um, if you're talking about doing archaeological consulting, like I was talking about earlier, 
uh, that that's done in Europe as well. And so every European country has has um, either government institutions or private companies like we have here that do consulting archaeology. And so I have a lot of colleagues in in France, for example, who work for the the you know the French government, and they do that sort of thing, consulting archaeology. That's their career. They go and 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 excavate ahead of uh, um, you know a, a new new highways, for example, and um, and they find sites all the time. Great questions, everyone. Yes, very good questions. Yes, really good. Okay, uh, well, we should probably move on. We have our student panel. So, um, Dennis, I just want to say a really big thank you for joining us this evening and sharing all that great information. Clearly, you in, intrigued uh, the students here this evening. Um, so, thank you. It's my pleasure. And uh, um, if done, if any. Students have any questions after the fact, of course, just, uh, you know, you can send them my way. Excellent. I will. Thank you. Take, take care, everybody, and good luck in your studies. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, um, well, first I'll say, before I introduce the students, um, I remember taking ARC 131 like four years ago and it still stands out as one of my favorite courses um, even though I'm in geography so I would recommend it to anyone it's one of the only textbooks I've read from front to back because it was so awesome so okay <laughs> that was a really great I loved listening to all these questions too okay so one of the ways our current students are involved in the faculty is becoming a peer mentor and we have three of our past enviro mentors here today they've been kind enough to come and speak a little bit about that experience and afterwards you can also ask them just questions about being a university student that's another reason they're here too so uh, i'll just call them in order and also to you three let us know your year and degree as well First, let's hear from Flora, who is a REM student. Thank you, Marina, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm in my third year studying at Resource Environmental Management. Um, being an environmental, I think going it, I actually started SFU as a psychology student. I didn't know anything about the faculty of the environment. I didn't know that the REM program existed. So I think one of the reasons why I became a environmental is to kind of like share that knowledge I have because um, I think I took a, a RAM course in my first year and I started like that's where I started developing my interest of like environment, of the environment and RAM and sustainability and everything that it has to offer. So yeah, environmental. Um, Unfortunately, because of COVID, it was really hard to have like a more of a in-person connection with my mentee. But we did like video call, we did um, message, and like during finals, we also like talked about our stress and kind of like ran to each other of, <laughs> of like how just like yeah, just like if you need someone to rant to, like it's like we're just like we ran to each other, and we also. Um, hosted events each month and some of the events include like a bonfire night and like finals prep. Yeah, that's basically it. So I'll let the other two speak. <laughs> awesome. Um, awesome. So yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned those events too, because I kind of forgot that we did those and it, it, it was a good opportunity for to have a little bit of face to face between the mentors and the mentees. All right, so next we're going to hear from Helen. So go ahead, Helen. Thanks, Maria. So hello, my name is Helen. I'm in my third year and I am an environmental science student and I'm specifically focused on applied biology. So I love all the fish and the trees, the turtles, that's right up my alley. And I became an environmentor because I actually had a mentor when I was in first year and like she kind of showed me the ropes of like all the cool hangout spots and like how to like be a university student and like all the kind of things, the ins and outs of SFU that I otherwise wouldn't have known as about. So I wanted to do that and give an opportunity for a first year student 
kind of learn from the things I've learned throughout my years. And yeah, it was super cool. Like, I didn't really know anybody else from my high school that was going to SFU to faculty and environment. So it was nice to like know somebody who was older and someone who had the experience. And it made me feel like, ooh, I'm like included in SFU and like how I'm like, I actually got excited to go to university and learn all this kind of stuff. So I'm really excited for you guys to like come join us and learn all these different things. And like Flora was saying, we have events on Zoom, they're online, we have like games night. And I think it's super important to separate like all the learning that happens online and also have like fun activities. Cause like when everything happens online, you get pretty tired of it, but then you have like a little escape and you can have fun, meet other people. And I think that's really cool. But that's all for me. I'll pass it off over to other people. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll mention that we'll definitely be revamping the mentor program for this fall. We sort of did it in the fall for that semester and then it slowed down for spring and we're going to bring it all back this fall. And then if any of you are going to come to SFU, there'll definitely be the opportunity for you to sign up and get paired with an older student, most likely in your same major. So it's a really good opportunity. All right. So lastly, we're going to hear from Beth from geography, so go ahead. You're muted, Beth. Or something's happening. I don't think her mic is connected. I yeah, I can't hear. Sorry, I thought it was my headphones. So I took yeah, no, it wasn't your headphones. Technical difficulties. Okay. It's gone pretty smooth most of the time, so that's yes, good. Yes, this is the thing. Most Zoom events have multiple hiccups, so. Um, I wonder if if Beth can hear us. Maybe you want to log out and log back in. And while we're doing that, um, I kind of wanted to, you know, oh, with the students. Oh, I'm going to hold off on on doing that. Uh, I was going to do the. We were going to ask you guys all to turn on your videos for a quick sec, so we could uh, start to put a face to a name, um, because we just. You know, we see all your names and some of you have been back a number of times and we just really wanted to get to know you a bit more by being able to put a face to a name. But then I just realized that we are recording this session and people may not be comfortable with doing that. So while we wait for Beth to come back on, we won't play that game. Oh, I just got her in the wait room. So she should be coming right back on now. Maybe at the end, we'll stop the recording and give everyone a chance to flick on their videos, but we'll, sure. we'll try Beth again. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, no worries at all. Of course that would happen to me while I try to do this. It's no problem. It, it happens to all of us and we can hear you very clearly now. So you're welcome to go ahead. I apologize, everyone. No like problem. I was saying, and you can hear me. <laughs> I'm at the end of my fifth year in a physical geography geoscience focus. So it's a bachelor's of science. And I'm also doing a GIS certificate, which I thought was really cool. I didn't find out about later till later. But um, main reason I joined the environmentors program was to help transition for the first year students coming into university. It was something I wish I had done. I learned about it later that I think it was offered the year I was a first year student, but I didn't know about it. So I just wanted to try and share my life experiences with everyone. And I also switched majors from, I started in earth sciences. So I had some experience switching majors, which I thought I could help someone else with. And I even had some younger friends coming to SFU a couple of years ago that were like, wow, I wish my faculty had this program. So I'm really glad I was able to be a part of that. But so my mentee, um, she was actually transferred from Douglas, so it wasn't her first experience in post-secondary, 
but I was still able to help her declare her major, decide that she wanted to do biogeography, that kind of thing. And I think the environmental program is also really beneficial in the sense of when you're like trying to plan your courses for this semester, it's nice to have someone that's actually taken the courses and is familiar with the workload, give you some guidance because as helpful as the advisors are, really awesome people, like sometimes they don't know exactly how much homework or how the exams are. So I think that was really good to be able to give that insight. Yeah, so that's all for me, I think. Great, yeah, that's a great piece of advice and it's super true. I mean, we all know as university students here that a lot of the conversations happening in our courses to other students is about, you know, how did you feel about the exam? Oh, have you taken this other course? You know, what was that like? What was the structure? Like we're always talking about all the little fine things about each course. So it's great to have, if you're a first student to talk to someone who knows the ins and outs of that stuff. So yeah, thank you to the three of you for sharing your insights on that. And I want to let the students ask any questions either about the mentorship program, which also Donna and I can answer about, or just about being a university student. No dumb questions, as Donna said, no dumb questions. So we'll leave it open to questions at any time. Yeah. They had so many great questions for Dennis. They've run out of questions. Yeah, I was surprised how many questions there were. But I mean, after that awesome presentation, I'm not surprised, I, I guess, because it's super intriguing. I almost wanted to raise my hand, even though I took the class already. <laughs> okay, so, students, come on, let's yeah. have some questions. Maybe while you're thinking about that, we wanted to do, oh, here's a good question, awesome. <laughs> Question for Helen, is there any advice you would give to someone going into the applied biology stream? Great question. Good question. So the applied biology stream is a little bit different than all the other environmental science um, concentrations in the sense that it's more science based. So you'll be doing a lot more physics, calculus, and like biology and like those kind of hard sciences courses than some of the other concentrations. So my best piece of advice is to always keep in mind, you might think, oh, biology, I did that in high school. Maybe that's not too bad, but uh, some of the courses are a bit heavier than others. So there's nothing wrong <laughs> with just taking maybe three courses or maybe like two heavier hard science courses and like a fun elective like Archaeology 131 and have a balance of the two because it might be a, a, a little overwhelming at the beginning as you're getting into it, but it's not too bad once you get into it. And if you can find the balance between the hard sciences and the increased course load, because you might think, oh, three courses, I took like eight courses in high school, I can do that. You go to university, it's a little bit different. So having a balance is my best key advice. Great. And there's another question similar to you, related to you. Someone's interested in what aspects you've enjoyed of, about environmental science so far. What's your favorite part, I guess? Ooh, my favorite part. I think there's a class called EVSC 100, so Environmental Science 100, which is a very introductory course to the field of environmental science. And I think that was one of like the best courses. That was actually the course that made me want to continue doing environmental science. And you get like an in-depth kind of look of like all the problems and all the things that are going on in the world. So you learn a little bit about like marine plastic pollution. You learn a little bit about um, climate change and global warming, and that kind of stuff. So I think what I really enjoyed was learning about all these problems that I've heard about, but really understanding the roots of like, why is it happening? What can we do about it? What research can we do about it? And like potentially come up with some solutions because they're pretty apparent now and you hear about them all the time. And it's kind of hopeful and uplifting that you can kind of find or try to find a solution. So I think that's kind of one of the aspects I really enjoyed, understanding the roots of the problem and what we can do about it. Very fun. Yeah, I loved that course too. 
I took it with Tara Holland, who was a previous speaker at one of these events or at a, another faculty event. And she's really, really awesome. Um, all right. Are there any other questions for our mentors? We got three awesome mentors here. And I think for EVSC 100 this fall, I think Brendan Murphy is is teaching oh, that right. class. He came then, on yeah. and spoke a he couple of sessions too. back. Yeah. And he's another great uh, mm -hmm. professor, speaker. Yeah. Yeah. No matter who teaches it, it's a great course. Yeah. And you don't have to be an EVSC major mm -hmm. to take the course either. So. Okay. So we have a little activity to do while you're thinking if you have any more questions um let me see here yeah we wanted to do a bit of a mood check-in because it's important to be mindful of your emotions and we want to know how you're doing so far some of you have been at several of these events so this is a little activity that we got inspired from another professor so I want you to type a color, the name of a color into the chat, red, yellow, or green. Red is if you still feel pretty stressed about coming to university. Yellow is if you're starting to feel, you know, you're a little so-so and you're kind of getting the gist of it. And green is you got this, I feel great, I'm ready for university. So you just have to type red, yellow, or green, and we want to get a sense of how you're feeling. <laughs> Greenish, yellow, love that. I like it. <laughs> Orange. Orange, oh gosh, you guys, color wheels. <laughs> I like purple, but I don't know which one that would be. A lot of yellow, a lot of in the middle. That's better than red. So that's good. And you could admit if you're super freaking out right now, because I know my summer before university was very stressful. I was super worried. <laughs> Same with before high school. It's sort of that feeling you get before going to a new school. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Okay. Well, we've got a couple more of these events. So hopefully you'll be green. Once you've come to those ones too, you're going to go right. One other question I thought we could ask them as they're still maybe putting some colors in there is, um, so we do have two more of these sessions uh, coming up. So it's every two weeks if you haven't um, figured that one out. So the next one is May 5th and then May 19th. And if you have any um, things that you would really like us to cover that we haven't covered yet, so the next one on May 5th, we're bringing in our four academic advisors. So from each of the four areas, and we'll have another panel of students coming to join us. And then the last one on May 19th is really just gonna be fun. So we're, we're just gonna do some fun uh, remote stuff. Uh, we're not gonna tell you what that is yet because you have to come and find that one out. But if there's other things that you, um, would really like us to touch on or bring someone in to speak about, uh, please feel free to put that in the in the chat and we'll do our very best to make that happen. Um, as we're closing, we're gonna put both uh, my email and Marina's email address in the chat. So you can also email us later um, if you think of something later and say, hey, could you guys touch on this? Uh, we're totally open to that. So right. feel free if there's any other uh, questions to pop them in. So Marina is going to put the registration link in the mm -hmm. chat. Uh, and this is the registration link for the May 5th event. You'll also, as, as you've been getting these um, invitations in, in your email, continue to check your email, you will get an invitation, but you can also go to this link and just add it in. Um, she's also added in the page to our, um, that one that's, uh, oh, she's gonna add the new students, oh, yeah, our Faculty of Environment new students page, and you can get more information about our mentors on that page. And that's also where we're gonna be loading, um, the recordings from previous ones. So if you haven't attended uh, one of the previous uh, 
of these Zoom events and you'd like to check it out, we will be loading up the recordings there. Um, and again, the mentorship stuff will be up there. If you haven't joined the SFU uh, 2021 undergrads Facebook group, I encourage you to mm -hmm. join that because there's lots of conversations going on there and lots of good information um, being shared on there. Um, residents, if you haven't, if you're hoping to stay in residence and you haven't yet applied for residence, because applying for residence is separate from your application for admission, um, the link is going in the chat for that. You can check that out. Um, and just a couple other uh, resources are there for you. Uh, so we just are winding down now. So um, any last questions from anyone while we're here? We just want to say thank you for joining us. We hope you're getting something out of these. We hope that you continue to um, come for the next couple sessions. Um, we're really excited for, for fall and hopefully getting a chance to meet with all of you in person. We just really want you to feel connected to the faculty in your department and um, to kick off your university knowing like you got this. Um, so thank you so much. Oh, there's a question. I was wondering what the uni prep courses are. I got an email about it. Oh, good question. Um, it's, it's an online course. Um, I really encourage you to click the link or get onto it. However, they tell you to get onto it. Um, they really go into a bunch of, uh, different information. Like there'll be university. I think there's university prep one university prep two. And then there'll be an SFU 101. So they're gonna talk about things like, um, you know, explaining what a, a, a faculty is and course credit is and what your degree is. Like uh, your degree is made up of 120 credits. And some of those are what we call WQB, which is writing quantitative and breadth requirements. You'll have certain requirements for your major, but then certain electives. So it, it explains how all that stuff works together. It'll also tell you stuff um, like how to get involved in camp on campus and volunteer opportunities. I think it's SFU 101 um, where you'll get in, put into a hive, they call it. Um, and, and that's a group of students that um, are in your same registered in at least one other class that you're registered in. So this will happen down the road, obviously, after you've done registration and a current student and they'll generate some conversations. Actually, I think Helen is uh, a hive leader for new students joining in summer. Um, so yeah, it's really good uh, content. You, you just read through it on online and it'll help to, again, just kind of bring some clarity to um, to what university is all about. Ah, there, Angel put, uh, put a link into some more information on that. Excellent. All right. We'll give you one last chance if you have any last question you wanna add. Okay, well, thank you again for joining us and uh, have a good rest of your evening and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Bye and thank you to the mentors for coming. Thanks so much. Yes.